So we're on chapter 20 of your world history, and we're talking about the British Empire during the 1800 and early 1900s. And we saw that the saying was that the sun never set on the British Empire. And God really blessed them in a lot of ways, although a lot of people would call it um, British imperialism. But indeed, um, England did give two things to most of these countries. And one was Christianity, and the other was a representative form of government and starting their countries um, on how to govern themselves. So, um, and plus, of course, we know that Britain um, benefited a lot from these countries, but they reigned for about a hundred years and then they started declining. And why would you think um, Britain would decline? What would be the reason behind this? You know, could it be the imperialistic uh, colonial governments um, uh, using some of the resources and such that they got from, from this land? Well, it could be, could be part of it. But if you look at the history of all nations, you'll find the big reason of decline is the decline in trusting the Lord. It's the decline in morality. So how did this happen? How could this happen to the British Empire that depended on the Bible? Well, let's see what happened. Queen Victoria, remember Queen Victoria, she said, I want to do good. That she reigned for 64 years and her heart was, I want to be good for the empire, for, the, the, for England and the British Empire. So the Queen's 64-year reign restored prosperity and dignity to the British Empire. But after the Queen's death in 1901, Edward, her son, he, he lived 1841 to 1910, he did not share his mother's resolution to be good. So morality fell and so did the empire. The Victorian era came to an end and Britain started to decline. Why? Well, it declined mainly because of the false philosophies that were at the door, at the door of the times, the signs of the times at that time. Now we have false philosophies trying to take over from the blessings of uh, true Christianity. The first was Darwinism. Charles Darwin, 1809 to 1882. Well, he was a British naturalist. I know you're learning about him in biology. He published on the origin of species. He proposed that life on earth had evolved over time through a process of natural selection. And this would, would replace God, the creator, with time, nature, and the processes and chance. So natural processes and chance, basically saying that, that um, species could evolve into new species, you know, kinds into new kinds. So few people took to this pseudoscience. They didn't take it very seriously. However, Darwin's ideas were accepted by those who wanted to break away from the moral restraints of society and religion. Those people who did not want to, to, to live a moral life decided, ah, evolution is a good way to go. Hmm. Soon evolution and Darwinism, I should say, soon this, this was falsely acclaimed to be a true science when it isn't a true science. We've been learning about this and I had actually a chapter that we just did in your biology this month. Thomas Henry Huxley. He lived 1825 to 1895. Well, who was Thomas Huxley? Well, he was the one that vigorously promoted Darwinism. He was also called Darwin's bulldog. You see, Darwin was pretty sick most of the time, so Darwin didn't go about and talk about his theory of evolution hardly very many times at all. So he had to have a promoter. And of course, this guy, um, he was basically an agnostic. He coined the term agnostic, 
which meant to describe one who believes in the existence of God, but anything that cannot be proven by materialism is not important. He basically says, uh, you don't, there's a God up there, but we don't have much to do with God, you know, um, what, mainly humanism. You can see here, huh, here's a, um, Thomas Huxley holding the skull there, you know. Anyway, materialism is the idea that matter is the only reality and that everything in the world, including thought, will, and feeling, must be explained in terms of matter. So it eliminates the spiritual aspect of human beings and puts them in the terms of the same as in any other animal. And then of course we have socialism. Socialism is the idea that government should own or at least control a nation's economy, including a nation's businesses, factories, and means of produce, produce to provide the needs of the people. So um, also uh, socialism, gets to the point, socialism gets to the point of even taking over all of private property. Socialism attacked Britain's economic success by retarding personal initiative and interfering with free enterprise. So I like this picture here, it says helping the poor. If you look at this picture here, so uh, the big government answer, socialism right here, is that we're gonna feed the poor, give them welfare, just give them what they need and keep feeding the poor and keeping them, keep them under, under, under our authority. And the free market answer is this ladder, is to teach them to teach them how to feed themselves and to teach them and that that thought that freedom give them the ladder so that they could actually the free market that they could come out of their poverty stricken um, situation and you'll see of course you see here these socialists from Karl Marx and to the Russians um, with Lenin and Stalin and Mao Zedong there so that socialism is a path right into communism. And of course, I do not like these fists. Whenever I see the fists, I always wanna put a finger that says one way to heaven on them because why are, they, why are they raising their fists? Well, that's what they do in socialism. Like, give me, give me. That's the sign. Utilitarians, who are they? Well, they're socialists. They were followers of this guy named Jeremy Bentham and another guy named John Stuart Mill. Here you have a picture of Jeremy Bentham. And so basically saying that um, laws should be judged by their utility. So that meant um, the greatest happen happiness principle. They believed that the goal of life, life is the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people, regardless of the means or consequences. So the largest amount of ple pe pleasure over pain. The goal of the law would be the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So this came, became accepted in the late 1800s and still is used today. So regardless of the means or consequences, huh? that's not a good thing, is it? Then we have the Christian socialists. Well, that's coming even today as we see the, the, the Christian church going this way of social justice and critical race and all these things. It happened back then. This is not the first time. If you look in history, what happened with Christian socialists? A Christian socialist is a group who once wanted benevolent social reform, but did not want to take the Bible literally. Basically saying, the Bible, we think it's a good book, but we don't really um, have much to do with it or believe in it. So they sympathized with organized laborers called Chartist and demanded the voting rights of all, which is one good thing. Um, Charles Kingsley, this guy here, Charles Kingsley, he was one of the most famous Christian socialists in 1819 to 1875 is when he lived during that time. Um, he popularized Darwin's um, evolution with ser sermons and pamphlets and novels and he, to support the Chartist movements, basically saying, yeah, ev we can make evolution is, um, is correct and we're still Christian. We'll just put evolution into our Christianity, 
which it doesn't work at all, does it? The Fabian Society. Now this is this is getting by getting on when you think of Fabian Society, I always think of the writer George Bernard Shaw from 1856 to 1950. So, and um, also there are other socialists, Sidney and Beatrice Webb. So they taught that socialism should be achieved gradually by a series of reforms, including pensions and food supplies from the government, the elimination of private property and government imposed minimum wage. Basically the government would control all of the property and any type type of um, pension that you would get, you'd have to get it from the government. And any food supply, you'd have to get all your food from the government and all your health care from the government. And also they would tell you your minimum wage and whatever you did, they would tell you that there's only a certain wage that you can make. So basically government control. And the Fabian Society was like this. Also, they said that the education should be managed and subsidized entirely by the government. They would not have Christian or private schools and that education should be under the control of the government. Their influence grew in the 20th century and came to include many influential writers and educators and journalists that wanted this Fabian socialist society. Here's a picture here. It says, I am a communist, but not a member of the communist party. Stalin is the first rate Fabian. I am one of the founders of Fabian and as such, very friendly to Russia, George Bernard Shaw. That's what he wrote back then. So we know that his Fabian society went right into communism. He's kind of a scary looking dude, isn't he? So anyway, let's get on. Fabian society, just remember that's George Bernard Shaw. Then we have modernism. If you see this picture up here, modernism is religious liberalism. And that means uh, humanism coming into the church. So you're combi combining your Christianity with humanism and living in this area, which does not work. You know, a double-minded uh, man is unstable in all of his ways, is what the Bible says. So walking with one foot in humanism and one foot in Christianity is not a good idea. But they, this was seeping in. Uh, it says Darwinism and socialism might have been defeated, but another ism rose, a philosophy that cut to the very heart um, of all that had made Britain great. So this ism was considered the worst. Modernism or religious liberalism began in Germany with faithless theologians who believed the Bible was merely a beautiful myth and full of errors. The church leaders became more concerned with attacking social injustices than bringing people to personal salvation through Jesus Christ. So basically they were saying, we're concerned, we're gonna be concerned by the areas of racism or the concerns, concerns of labor or the, these other concerns of the world, but we're not gonna have anything to do with Jesus. So don't bring Jesus into our reform. Ha, isn't that what they're doing even now in America? So in 1880, the false doctrines had worked their way into Britain, and this brought about England's decline. How did England decline? With false doctrines and false beliefs. Um, basically, Satan getting a hold of the Christians, Christianity in England. So the acceptance of these ungodly philosophies would later have terrible consequences for both Europe and the entire world. <sighs> We're just having history repeat itself here. I mean, all of Europe um, has been corrupted by religious liberalism. Um, and wherever you go, including, including um, a lot of the British uh, commonwealths like Canada and um, Australia. In America, we have a remnant of true believers, but now with all that's coming in with social justice and, and the, the gospel coalition and onto, um, onto religious liberalism and the humanism creeping in, 
we have the same same thing going on as Britain declined, America will decline, decline too, if we don't look to Jesus. So, you know, I was told they were having a, a, a Antifa Black Lives Matter thing going on, and I was I was told I thought I'm gonna go out there and just they just need Jesus. And someone said, a Christian actually said, how dare you go there and get off on Jesus? They have what they're supposed to do. They are social reformers, and now you're bringing Jesus into the story. Huh? <laughs> Isn't that what they said in England, too, before England declined? We need to look unto Jesus because he's the answer. He is the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him. The descent of the modernists, liberal Christianity. So here we see liberal Christian down the steps of Christianity. We see huh, that the Bible, they say first, they say the Bible is a human book. Um, and optimism is about humanity. God works through human institutions. They focus on Christ as a human example of God consciousness. The denial of miracles the soup in denying the supernatural including the virgin birth and the resurrection they deny those the denial of atonement and the preferred moral influence theory and the emphasis on this life in social gospel and not on evangelism the rational theology and non-inclusive faith the tolerance of all different religions. It says truth evolves. Christian doctrine is developmental. This is liberal Christianity that we want to have nothing to do with. And you see the descent as you go from, from true Christianity all the way down to agnosticism and then the next step to atheism. Very sad descent. So that's what happened in England. And England um, had the Bible and believed in the Bible. But over the decades, this would happen. So this is what's been happening in America. So we need to go back to our first love, Jesus Christ, and repent of our sins and look unto him, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen.